Pretty amazing. What five hands or what five fingers can do to a microphone? Well, I'll start again, but good afternoon. Uh, we're here on this sad occasion to farewell a very much admired and loved lady, Cynthia. Cynthia was first a daughter, a sister, a wife, a mum, an auntie, Grandma and a great grandma. Also, she was a best friend to some and a good friend to many more. Scripture reminds us that it's okay to be sad. There's a season for sadness and a season for joy. And it's what we're going to do here today. We're going to celebrate the sinful story. And I hasten to add that. Some of you may have a couple of tears, but that's okay. Even Jesus cried at the death of his friend Lazarus. My name is Greg Siri, and I'm a part of the fellowship here at Maynardville. So, on behalf of the family and seasons, oh sorry, the funeral company, just nations, we have the honour of conducting this service here today. Can we all just bow our heads and pray? Heavenly Father, I ask that you would make your presence felt amongst us. Minister to us as from your Holy Spirit. Where there is sadness, replace it with joy of knowing the special. Lord, comfort us. Strengthen us in the journey of you. Surround us with your love. And we pray this in and through the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Now, just a couple of uh, housekeeping rules. For those who are not uh, members of the church or have been here before, welcome. The most important rooms go past the kitchen. Turn to the right, and they're at the back of that hall. You know which room I mean. <laughs> yeah, there is one closer. Just go down near the cry room. And some of us are blessed and cursed for these things. I just wonder if you could take a moment, say good day to the person next door to you, and turn your phone off. Or it may be turned it on silent. So we can spend this time on the center. We're also going to be video taping the service here today. And that's so that it can be sent back to England. So if you'd like to face Rob over there, just give him a wave, we can wave for him. Oh, <laughs> well, most of you know that Cynthia was born in England on the 2nd of April, 1936, just before the outbreak of World War II. Now this wouldn't have been an easy task uh, for her parents, Noel and Violet, especially when you think of the bombings, the rationings, 
Life would have been pretty tough growing up in England in those times. But you know what? Even though they were rationed, they never rationed their love. And they survived and they got through it. Cynthia went through the normal schooling at that time. And later on she went to work at Brown Trees, a factory in York, somewhere I'd like to go. Then she met a young man called Sid. And you know the story and the history began from there. They migrated to Australia, raised two boys, Bill and Wayne, um, to join the fellowship here at Maynabar. They were long-time members of this church, but more importantly, they were married for over 60 years. That's incredible. But you know what? Sadly, Sid passed away a couple of years ago, and Cynthia was on her own. But she wasn't really on her own. She had a family close by and we visited her. And uh, you know, I can only do a small snippet of her life. I'm going to ask Pat now to come forward. No, sorry. <laughs> Would you like to come forward, Grace? Since it's favourite psalm. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me down. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord ever. I have to say it's not going to be the first time you hear that psalm. I would invite uh, Pat Neal to come forward and share with her, uh, share with us, her stories of a very special lady. Pat? My name is Neil, and Cynthia was my pseudo sister. As we journey through life, as we journey through life, we meet some people, and they change our lives forever. And Cynthia did that for me. I clearly remember the first time I saw. It was my first day working around trees, and I was in the club room. This pretty young girl came in, surrounded by a group of other girls. She had long, wavy hair, and although I didn't know it at the time, she had just come back from her honeymoon. About six months later, she came to work beside me, and I realised who she was. I didn't know it then, but I was destined to see her almost every day for the next 50 years. We immediately became friends, and you all know the story that she came to sit to my 21st birthday, and I married her brother, Trevor. Six, eight months later, she slept with me the night before my wedding so that I wouldn't be alone. She was my bridesmaid, and I even wore her wedding dress. 
four of us were a group. We put houses together in Huntington, went on holiday together, and brought our boys up again. After 10 years, we all decided to come to Australia. And yes, you guessed it, we bought our houses back to back. We saw each other every day. <laughs> Cynthia loved music, and she was a member of Roundtree's Theatre before she met C. So it was no surprise when they joined the Calamander Choir. And although Trevor and I were not members, we supported them by being in charge of the suppers after the show. You could not help but like Cynthia. She was funny, witty, smart, loyal, talented, feisty, she blamed that on her red hair, generous, and above all, she loved her family. I feel privileged to have known her and to have shared this journey through life with her for the last 70 years, throughout all the good times and the bad. And even though I say goodbye with a heavy heart, I have memories of a woman who was loved and respected by everyone who knew her, especially me. share their memories. Please don't believe him if he tells me he was Cynthia's favourite child. <laughs> April 2nd, 1936, York, York. A little girl was born with tight hats and feet and flaming red hair. She was Nolan Buffett's third child, sister to Dennis and Trevor, ten and seven years her senior, respectively. The circumstance she found herself in, of being the only girl amongst boy cousins, two brothers, made feistiness necessary for survival. She was, at her best, four, and four feet, eleven and a half inches, but full of pluck and completely able to stand up for herself. There was to be a lad in her future that found himself in hot water when he tried to tell her what to do, but more of that later. Cynthia was four when the war began, frightening years for all the family. A time of rations, making do with very little blackout curtains at night, air raids, sirens, and a shelter built by her dad in the backyard. There were memories of being lifted hastily from her bed in the night and taken to the shelter where they and many neighbours huddled for safe as bombers flew overhead. Cynthia had a favourite saying in later years when life was challenging. We came through the war, we can cope with this. Surviving this, Cynthia's young life was filled with family living close by and happy school years. She did, however, dislike the school dinners, so her challenge each day was to leave school on the lunch bell at 11.50 and run as fast as she could to reach home before the York Minster bells chimed midday. There her mum's cooking was much better and she ambled back to school with Tommy. There were various scrapes, an issue with a safety pin that she swallowed, requiring cotton wool sandwiches to be eaten to deal with the pointy end of the problem, a stray air rifle pellet that lodged into her forehead without serious consequences, thankfully. Being in trouble at school more than once, apparently, and choosing to have the cane rather than missing her beloved sport as a punishment, and being the target of a volley of snowballs that aimed at her by a group of boys on her way to school, 
for which she retaliated, giving them more than they bargained for. Contracting scarlet fever was more serious. The house was fumigated and she spent some time in hospital and she was left with a degree of rheumatic heart disease. A young Judy Dench was a little playmate for the time that Judy's dad was the local doctor. She left school at 16 and became a tailoress in training at Montague Burton, where they made suits. For a better way, she left there and went to work at Roundtree's Chocolate Factory, where she could take home a roll of her favourite blackcurrant pastilles as she pleased, and holidays in Dunolly were provided, all expenses paid if you'd been unwell for recuperation. Then there was Saxon's shoe store. This was perhaps her favourite place of employment as she loved shoes and there she had access to the smaller size. Her size five feet were a problem right through her life but at Saxon's she could not only get them, she had choice. It was at the age of 16 that she began to attend the village dances on a Saturday night. She loved to dance and these years were where many fond memories were made. Memories she talked about for the rest of her life. One night the aforementioned lad arrived at the village dance after finishing his time of service in the Air Force. He was 21. Cynthia spied him from across the room and noticing her too, he asked her to dance. The story goes that he told her he was going to marry her and from there completely monopolised her, asking her for every dance. While a little put out by this, Cynthia had to admit to herself that she rather liked him. He was funny, charming and a great dancer. Because they were a similar height, when they danced, they were as one. A posture that was to characterise their whole marriage. When Sid passed away in February 2022, through her sadness, Cynthia said, Well, all I can say is we had a ball. The feistiness of Cynthia's younger years younger days, became strength as a young woman. She drew on this strength when at the age of 22, her first child Wayne was born with complicated health issues. As a couple, they would travel frequently to Great Ormond Street Hospital for appointments. It was in London, sometimes there and back in one day, an eight hour round train trip at 31, Cynthia and Sid and boys emigrated along with Cynthia's brother Trevor and wife and best friend Pat and their two boys to start a new life in Australia, leaving family and friends. While she enjoyed her new life, there was an underlying homesickness that persisted until her first grandchild was born in 1986. There was a girl who walked past Sid and Cynthia's home in Albemarle Way on her way home from school. Soon she was introduced to the family by Phil and this was where my relationship with Sid and Cynthia began. They were friendly and welcoming and Sid would tease me mercilessly. I would believe everything he told me and he loved it. For a time, Phil and I parted company, but my fondness for his mum continued and I would still call in on my way home from school to sit at their tiny built-in table and bench seat in their sunny yellow kitchen for a chat, making sure I left before Phil arrived home from work. She made it quite clear that she was not happy with this new situation and that she wanted me as their daughter-in-law. In 1984, Mum's wish was granted and Phil and I were married. 
our relationship deepened to one of friendship and love. Mum would often tell people she couldn't have loved me anymore. I'd been her own daughter. I'm grateful and privileged to have been loved in this way. Both mum and dad were always there to help their children for renovations, even though they had thought we were mad for buying our renovators to life with our children in tow and life in general. One life in general incident, the manager of Forestfield Falls felt acutely. I was expecting the twins and I was having difficulty pushing the trolleys with their wheels pointing in all directions. They asked to speak to the manager and told him, in no uncertain terms, that if he didn't do something about the trolleys, I'd have my babies in the middle of the store. The next week, all the trolleys had been replaced with new ones. <laughs> Broth and chips was a long and beloved tradition in our family, and one that Mum treasured very much and carried as one of the highlights of her week. It began one day when her and Dad were in Kalamunda grocery shopping, and Mum had a low blood sugar episode. Most of you know that she was a diabetic. They went into the cafe for a coffee and something to eat. Passing by, my auntie Pam and Granny, and they joined them. They decided it was a great idea to finish grocery shopping with a coffee, and so began a tradition that lasted for 30, 30 years. It was called Froth and Chips because James and Jason were very small when I joined the coffee after shopping. As there were no baby chinos in those days, we all donated the froth from our cappuccinos and hot chocolate to them and shared a bowl of hot chips. In the holidays, we would have to pull a few tables together to cater for the expanding family. Sadly, as life became busier in the last few years, and we didn't meet as often, Mum would look at me sometimes and say, I need to go shopping. And I knew what she meant. This story is reflective of Mum's pleasure and delight in the simple things of life. Coffee with family, a drive in the country, favourite places to visit. She was so easily pleased and always grateful for anything that anyone did for her. She was the most contented, cheerful person I have ever known. The choir gave both of them much pleasure over many years, and by all accounts, they provided their sparkle to the group. Four of us sang together regularly at Madabelle Baptist Church to lead the singing on a Sunday morning. Both her and Dad became a part of Madabelle, where they came each Sunday to worship. Mum's faith was simple and heartfelt, and I know she prayed for us each night. In recent times, she very much enjoyed having the Bible read to her and hymns played. Mum took her courage and her positivity in both hands on a difficult day in July 2022. when we took her to begin her life. At St Vincent's residential care. We had stayed with her during the preceding week. That morning I took her a cup of tea in bed and she said, I'm going to the home today, I'm tired. 
Yes, I'm sorry. Well, she said, don't worry about me. I'm going to make the best of it. I'm going to go in there and liven them all up. <laughs> True to her word, she did. She walked the corridors, chatting to people, joined in the activities, bringing her sunny disposition with her. She complimented every staff member who entered her room on their shoes, or their hair, or their skin, or an item of clothing, or anything else that caught her eye. She always went to the dining room for her meals, ready for a good chat and a laugh. The other residents loved her, and one of them told me that she had made their life better. Thank you to all the staff at St Vincent's. We are deeply grateful for you all being so invested in providing a meaningful life for her during the past 20 months that she was with you. Thank you for loving her and caring for her in perhaps one of the most difficult times of her life. Thank you. Our feelings of home, love and security were in the daily ways of doing things that provided the backdrop for conversation, discussion of worries and concerns, and many funny stories. Both of them would always see the funny side of life. Table was set for lunch on a Wednesday when I went to my lunch break, and Phil, when he was working locally, for a cheese and mustard pickle sandwich a little bowl of crisps because she knew I liked them, china teacups, milk in a tiny jug, plenty of tea. Again, the table set for fish and chips on a Sunday night so that it didn't matter how many of us came, we just bought more fish and chips. I have the vinegar bottle because besides vinegar, it's full of memories mainly of the browning fish and chips with the vinegar because it couldn't quite work before. And mum and dad's pure enjoyment of having us all with them. She told us many times that she loved us. Especially in the last few months, so we have never had any doubt the way she felt. Now, without them, Zira has come to an end. The life lived alongside these precious people. What's so many years is no longer. But we have rich memories of them and their unconditional love for us. The deep love they had for their family and each other. We love you both and we will miss them. Funerals just don't happen. It takes a lot of organisation. Talk amongst yourselves for a while. <laughs> <laughs> the Ed and Angela are at Stevens. It's the third time we've kept this out. 
we thank you for all that. The family and friends who just jumped in and wanted to help, the light and the load made it so much easier for us and we appreciate it. But what I remember of growing up is great holidays in Calvary with the family and the grandparents. The smell of pippers coming out of the kitchen at, Christmas, at lunchtime and the house up above the river mouth on the hill that's swaying in the stick sea breeze. I remember hot evenings in the backyard sitting at a table under the black rock room trying not to let the caterpillars drop into our food. Mum's grip on fashion. Mum was ahead of time and good with the sewing machine. The great idea was to make Wayne and I a shirt each. Not just any shirt, but a floral shirt. His was purple, mine was pink. <laughs> Mum decided then that they would look better with a tie. Not a contrasting tie, but a tie made out of the same material. <laughs> Weren't we the coolest kids in Sunday school? <laughs> no. We would arrive home from Sunday school, get changed, have lunch, get into a game of something, and then Mum would say, I've decided we're all going to go for a drive and walk around my dairy here. Yes, back into the shoe, back into the tide, no matter what the temperature was. The sad thing is, a few people here, quite a few people here, who were in this church in the early 70s, would remember the stylish Heptons. I was thinking of wearing a white tie and a white shirt to eat just as a reminder of it. No. Mum grew up, grew up tough. She had, after all, she married Dad. Dad, the guy who always had an opinion. And mum, the red-headed firecracker, is waiting to go off. <laughs> Would have loved to been a fly on the wall that, uh, that day at the first, when mum had her first dance with dad, dad telling her to dance with him and then telling her he was going to marry her. I'm sure Dad didn't get the response that he was expecting, but he won. A few of her, Wayne's introduction into the world was not a smooth. It was a tough start for Mum and Dad, as they became first-time parents. And next came Dad's diagnosis of asbestosis. This was another setback of the life that they used to live. I also remember a day that they came to watch play cricket. They left the game early and I later was told that Dad had a stroke. Next came open heart surgery, followed by not one but two cardiac arrests. We took Mum to say goodbye twice in that time. Mum stayed strong. But finally, three months later, Dad came home. With Wayne's health on the decline and numerous hospital trips, Mum decided that he should move back home. Mum was 82 and Dad was 87. Not the perfect situation, but it was what Mum wanted. Twelve months later, I moved Wayne into care. Another blow to Mum's plan. Twenty twenty one. Twenty twenty one had Dad had us sending Dad into hospital numerous times, and finally in twenty twenty two we passed away. We saw then what a good job Dad had done taking care of mum. 
And we, as much as we tried, could not let her live by herself. And in the middle of 2022, mum needed to care. Wayne also sadly passed later that But this time, mum could not hold on to the new memory and we were faced with difficult discussions on many occasions. During the last few years, mum is sad on dad's funeral due to hospitalisation. She missed Wayne's farewell due to having COVID. She had a serious infection and also had COVID a second time. Despite all of these setbacks, because of her strength and positivity, she still considered that she had a great life. Come out. I was shocked to learn that 70% of people in nursing homes don't get any visitors. You may have visited, a, visited, a, visited, visited mum once, twice, once a month, once a week, even more. You wouldn't be aware that you were part of a team, a team that made mum one of the most visited restaurants in the nursing home. Residents in the nursing <laughs> The Ian and Lauren of Empathy Care. With Ian I was best friends before, but the bromance really started five years ago when we put my in care. Thank him for sharing the journey and sorry that it saw us at our absolute worst. So the choir? What did you do to my dad? You turned him into someone that I've never seen before. Your friendship over the 25 years to mum and dad has been a joy for both of them. And to the people at the Maidavale Baptist Church who have supported parts of our family for over 50 years and are still supporting us today, thank you. Liven the place up, she said, and liven it up. On the day that she passed, Colette and I went, went to see Mum on the day of her passing. Colette called, say Mum had gone. I went to the nursing and we sat with her for a few hours. Suddenly, the power went off. I turned to Colette, smiled and said, Cynthia has left the building. <laughs> Mum, Dad and Wayne have gone. They've left us with three special things. Great memories, great family, and great friends. Let us smile when Bill was telling me that all the staff thought mum was quiet. Very softly spoken. Then Phil told me about the times with the had. It wasn't so softly spoken, was it, mate? No. I did mention that Psalm 23 was her favourite psalm. I believe it was also her favourite song. I'm going to invite you to stand, stretch your legs, and join us in singing Psalm uh, 3.
that a picture is going to paint a thousand words. We're going to be blessed with the library through the pictures the family have prepared for us. So please sit and enjoy.
Play their game, they uh, It's always hard to understand when death that happens. But I can encourage you in some way. The depth, the depth of the hurt you feel, or the loss you feel, is only a sign of the depth of the love that you had for her, that she had. The second reading comes from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Come unto me, all ye who labour and are heavy burden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn, for I am weak and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto yourselves, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I mentioned that uh, she loved Psalm 23. And some of you are bushies, believe, and you know what sheep can be like, and you know how stubborn they can be. But we're not talking about those times. We're talking about the times of uh, young David, who became king at a later time. Looking after his sheep, it was a trust issue. The sheep actually had to trust. And he knew each and every one of them by name. It's the same Christ that knows you, each and every one of you by name. We just sometimes have to learn and trust him a bit more. And just as a shepherd would lay down his life for his sheep in those days, I'm not talking about... Uh, had cow disease or any other diseases. And probably most we talk about the dingoes, snakes up in the top hats. David was hunted with bears, lions, and he defended his ship. He was prepared to die for just as Christ was prepared to die for each and every one here today. We now sadly come to the time of the middle. And if it's possible, and if you feel comfortable, would you please be outstanding? I'll give the words of committal, and then I'll give the benediction. We now come to the time we say farewell. Cynthia. At this time I will also ask the poor bearers to come forward. Cynthia, we are set by your departure. But we have been blessed by your journey amongst us. Go in peace with our love and blessings to be reunited with your Sid and Wayne and all of those who have gone before you and who have travelled to where you are heading. Peace be with you. The benediction for us all is it. And now may the grace of God, the love of his Son Jesus Christ, and the peace and comfort through his Holy Spirit be with you all, and now, forever. Amen. Just before we go, on behalf of the family, I wish to thank each and every one of you for being here. And I also add that today isn't the end of their journey. Please keep them in your minds in the weeks to come, and the journey ahead of them as they travel Cynthia. Would you mind standing? I'll ask the young directors to come forward and we'll proceed out of the chapel. If you wish to follow, please do so. Or just follow the family in and have a cup of tea. But can I also encourage you to share your own stories of this amazing woman? Thank you and God bless.